was in Southern California at the ass end of the 1920s in a small farming community that a series of murders would occur. Murders so brutal that the town they occurred in would change its name in an attempt to erase the memory of the events that had occurred there. was only the most visible sign of a massive economical collapse. A collapse that would spread like syphilis from Wall Street to Main Street. And in 1929, four million American families were without any means of support. This would become known as the Great Depression. And as you can gather, there was nothing great about it. Every day more layoffs, more bankruptcies, more people broke not being able to make their mortgage payments. Even U.S. Steel, an industrial symbol of American power since the turn of the century, laid off its entire full-time payroll of 225,000 workers, and all of them wondering where their next meal were coming from. But the Great Depression showed no favoritism, and it hit the city just as hard as it hit the rural areas which culminated in one of American history's worst droughts, turning the whole country into a dust bowl. But all of that was about to be overshadowed by a gruesome crime that would come to light. Gordon Stewart Northcott moved from Canada to California when he was 13 years old. This is all about the same time his mother started dressing him up as a girl and his father started drilling for oil in his ass. I guess these days the left-wingers and the alphabet people would consider him a bit of a role model. Hell, he'd probably even be big on TikTok. But back then, if you were a dude, your mama dressing you up in girly dresses and your father blowing his load in you want something you brag about at the baseball diamond. Ah, oh, jeez, I think I just got myself shadow banned. In the late 1920s, just outside of the quaint suburbs of Southern California, you could find yourself smack dab into rural farming communities. And before the great fall of 1929, you could still earn yourself some decent scratch. But make no mistake, it was hard work, and no one was gonna hand you over a shiny nickel without a little blood and sweat. For reasons that I suppose are only known to himself, Gordon, or Gordy, as he was known as, when he was 19 years old, asked his father to buy him a plot of land and lend him some money so he could start a chicken farm. His father, who was a builder and doing okay for himself, I guess he figured he owed his son something and short of doing a reach around, lent his son the money and helped him build the farm. But I guess this being before there were a KFC, chicken farming weren't all it were cracked up to be. The isolation, the long hours, and Gordy decided he needed some help. Enter one Sanford clock. The farmer's nephew imported right out of Canada, offering the kid three squares a day, roof over his head, a bed, a steady wage, all the chicken McNuggets you could eat, 
I guess it were an offer that Sanford couldn't turn down. And although the mother showed some trepidation at first, hell, it's your Uncle Gordy. What could possibly happen? So he packed up and boarded a train to Cali, where it was said that all the women tasted like ripe peaches and there were an orange grove in every backyard. The young Dean would later testify that evening when he arrived, he was bent over a kitchen table and given the business by his uncle. And he would continually rape him regularly during his stay at the ranch. I guess there wasn't too much chicken farming going on on that ranch. But considering the homosexual vernacular identifies a young gay man as a chicken, well, I suppose that there were plenty of chicken farming going on. The only difference being that the farmer was laying seed in his nephew's ass. It was raining on that day when Walter Collins asked his mother for some scratch so he could go to see the moving pitches. Handing her only child a dime, she told him to be good and to be home for dinner. But it was the last time she would ever see her son again. There were no witnesses, and no one could even say if he made it to the movie theater. It was like he vanished into thin air. What we now know is that the chicken farmer, in his fagmobile, with the assistance of his nephew, lured the young child into his car and brought him back to his farm, where the kid would be kept alive for a week, chained to a bed in a chicken coop, only to be raped and brutalized, and only offered food when he pleased his master by making him come. When Gordy Northcott was arrested and gave a written confession to the murder, bizarrely, his mother came forward and said she was the one who killed him with an ax, saying that her, her son, and the nephew took turns beating the kid with a shovel. And then when the kid had had enough, she stepped in with an ax and finished him off. But cops figured that this was a grift, and she were only stepping up to save her ass pussy loving son from the hangman's noose. And although the mother and son had both admitted to the murder, there was no physical evidence that Walter Collins had ever been at the chicken farm. By the start of 1929, the LA County Sheriff had received an unusual amount of reports of missing young boys, and twice that amount who had claimed they'd been picked up off the streets, taken to a farm, raped, and then driven back home, including a Mexican, naked, without his head. The county sheriff was still able to put this down to kids running away, on a quest for adventure, riding the rail, and the Mexican kid must have just accidentally got his head cut off when he'd fallen off a train after having ass sex. It happens, I knew this guy in Mississauga. No, oh, that's another story. But now with the Collins kid's case making the headlines, police wanted it to go away. And it did for a short while when cops claimed that they found Collins riding on a boxcar in Illinois. But when they stuck the brat back to his mother, she wasn't impressed and told the cops that he won her son. But cops told her to take the kid home for a while and try him out. She may like him. And when she kicked up a fuss and started squawking, they threw her in a mental institution. She got out six weeks later and would go on to sue the police. And it probably come to no one's surprise that although a court order, the cops never paid up. By all accounts, Lewis and Nelson Winslow, beside the fact that they look like cartoon characters, were just your average playful kids. Living in an upscale neighborhood in Pomona, they were coming home from the yacht club where they were members, and they disappeared like ghosts. Ghosts who looked like cartoon kids. The parents, who weren't shot on scratch, put up a reward. But besides a bunch of money grub and crack pots, no one came forward, and the case went cold. With the G-men convincing the boys' parents that through their investigations, they found out the kids had run away to join the circus. But the reality that they were about to find out would be much more grim. Northcott, with the assistance of his nephew, driving his fagin wagon, abducted the two young boys when they were returning home from the yacht club bringing him back to his chicken farm. Once there, he would take turns on the two boys, beating and raping them, while I guess his nephew would act as a fluffer and sometimes get to join in. But it was on the third day after the abduction, while having sex with Lewis, being unable to maintain an erection, and in an act of frustration, he picked up a nearby ax and cut the kid's head off. Shit still at the end of his dick. His nephew screaming, the headless kid's brother crying for his mother, 
God he figured he'd finish his job and he cut the other kid's head off. He would later tell the police that he'd been in love with the older brother, and he thought he saw the kid smirking at him. Holy macaroni, hasn't this guy ever heard of Viagra before? You're frustrated, try punching a wall. It was during an unexpected visit from his older sister that Sanford got her alone for a second and he spilt the beans, telling her the whole goddamn story about how his uncle were a fairy, but the Collins kid, the headless Mexican, and how they were driving around in the faggot wagon, abducting and killing kids. And the sister, after hearing this, well, she went straight to the cops. And when she started squawking to the G-men, the story seemed so fucked up, it was unbelievable. But on the other hand, it was too fucked up to be unbelievable. But when she mentioned the headless Mexican kid, they knew they'd struck gold, cause she told them details they hadn't released to the papers. And they were shocked that the pedo killer had been under their noses the whole time. But when they raided the ranch, Gordy wasn't there. He was in town with his mother, picking up supplies. So they hid and waited. But when Gordy were returning, he spotted one of the G-men and got wise to it. And the two of them amscrade towards the Canadian border. But the FBI notified the Canadian cops, and the duo were arrested a short time later. And the gig were up for the McAss pussy loving chicken farmer. Legion forever! <laughs> 